Hey guys, Savage Joy here with Real Progressives. Tonight I am joined by an awesome revolutionary um, who a lot of you guys know, Miss Yane Indigo. Um, I've met her a few times at different activist events, including Occupy DNC, um, that hell week. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us tonight, Yane. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, so we are actually coming up on the two year anniversary um, this month, which is kind of crazy because I, along with many people, still have PTSD like it was yesterday. So what is it like for you um, as one of the co-organizers um, to see how much has happened in the past two years? Um. I don't know, like, you know, I, I, that's a hard question to answer as it relates to, you know, like what's happened. I've just really, you know, I don't think I was totally surprised by um, what what happened. And, um, and I think that, you know, it just kind of was like par for the course, um, you know, as um, it was just, it's pretty normal to be disappointed by um, the government <laughs> for, to me, you know, that's kind of like standard. Um, I mean, there were some things that um, I didn't realize, um, you know, so, you know, I just kept working, you know, I'm really about liberation. I'm really about, um, you know, the um, ending the murdering of, you know, the children and the um, mothers and fathers and um, grandfathers and my community about, um, you know, generating a world of equity and peace and justice and um, where joy is able to thrive and not have to be an act of revolution in and of itself. Um, and so, you know, I just, you know, continue to strive. Um, you know, I learned some things. I definitely learned some things, particularly as it relates to um, electoral politics, particularly as it relates to um, counting on people who are involved in, this, in, these, um, in these things and just really um, the importance of prioritizing the um, the work, and you know, and that's what I do, and that's what I have been doing. And I think you're you're a really good example of that because it, after Occupy DNC, it was so easy to just be like, you know what, screw it, I give up. Like we're everything's stacked against us. We have no hope. This, I mean, we worked our asses off. And this is what happened. Um, so a lot of us, you know, at least for a short time became defeatist. And people like yourself just said, I'm going to keep going. Um, so that's, you know, you have that warrior spirit and people look to that. Um, well, mm -hmm. I'm a black woman. So, you know, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, there's always, I mean, I'm always, um, you know, kind of, at the barrel of a gun. And, you know, I mean, it's been centuries of, of fighting and battling, you know, for just even some of the most basic um, liberties in my community. So, you know, an, an election going awry, I mean, yeah, there was a lot of hope um, that was um, generated um, not only by um, Bernie's campaign, but also by the fervor, um, you know, uh, that um, that was, you know, around the campaign, um, certainly. But, um, you know, like, there's no option around, like, for me, giving up means letting a bunch of um, the children in my community for these prisons. And, you know, it means that, you know, I continue, I mean, it's, I've been, I was walking into the schools in my community where they don't have a playground, where the kids will, um, you know, are trying to run around, but there's there the even the the surface that they're playing on has so many holes that the kids are, you know, where elementary school children are spraining their ankles, where they can't get nutritious meals, you know. I mean, the community that's right next to the community that I um, that I was living in in Philadelphia has um, is fighting a power plant. You know, um, my community is constantly you know, amongst those communities and other sunk communities that are being um, trashed on, um, dumped on um, with, you know, environmental hazards, you know, 
this is this is all par for the course. And so, you know, I don't ever have the option of thinking, oh, you know, this didn't work out. I'm going to throw out my hands. This, it, you know, this has been going on, you know, since since enslavement, since sharecropping, since Jim Crow, since you know, um, you know, now mass incarceration. You know, all of these police murders that are happening constantly in my in in, in our community. So, yeah, like. I think that uh, to, to decide to throw up one's hands is definitely a luxury. And it's not a luxury that I, as a black woman, um, am entitled to. Right on. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, you became known for initially was your appearance on CNN. It was epic. Mm -hmm. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> the the woman who they had um, representing Hillary was just an ass. And she actually made the comment um, essentially that Bernie and Hillary's platforms were the same. Um, they were very similar. He, his was just, um, you know, basically semantics. Um, and you held your own. You said, I will not vote for her. Right. And it was so important for people like myself who are Bernie or bust and who do not regret it, no matter what people say. Um, it was so important to get that message on the mass media and be like, hey, we exist. We're out there. We will not fall in line. Um, so how did how did that come about? How did, who contacted you? Did, did CNN reach out to you? Well, actually, I was recommended. Um, I don't even know if I want to say who I was recommended by at this point. Um, but I was I was recommended. Um, um, they were looking for a someone who was um, a voter who was going to be voting that day to come in. Um, so what happened really was the day before I was on another CNN show. I was on a panel, and um, and they they had people who were there voting who were voting for various of the candidates. And so there were two Clinton um, supporters there. There was um, someone there that was planning to vote for Trump, someone there was planning to vote for Cruz. Um, I was there, you know, as a Bernie voter. And when um, when they they asked different people questions throughout the, the course of the show, and so it was became apparent that I was Bernie or bust. And um, and I also in that interview indicated that if I was not, um, if Bernie wasn't the nominee, that I would not give it my, um, I wouldn't give my vote to Hillary Clinton, that I would probably vote as I, as I did find. And, um, and so, the um, woman, Carol Costello, saw that interview and, um, and and had her producers contact, either her or her producers, and they contacted me and asked me to come back on on election day, on the day after election. So that's how I ended up on the second one, the one that everyone saw. But I was originally referred to the first to the first show, which was um, New Day, also on CNN. And that was that was just it was so amazing being at home and watching that. It was so satisfying to just hear, um, first of all, someone call out her on the Haiti bullshit that people seem to just forget about all the time. And when I talk about it, accuse me of lying. Um, you brought up a really good point about the minimum wage in Haiti. Um, and there there were um, six women from Haiti who were protesting at Occupy DNC. I'm not sure if you met them, but they were no. amazing. And they had signs saying like, where is our money? Where, you know, she supposedly raised all this money for the hurricane victims, yet they never received a penny. Um, right. So, mm -hmm. so right. as far as Haiti goes, what? why did you bring that up? Why was that out of all the things there's so much to complain about with her. Um, why are you uh, passionate about that? What? Why did that come to your mind? Um, I mean, there are so many things. It's just limited time. I mean, I really care very much about what happened in Haiti. You know, Haiti is a special um, country, a special community. One of the reasons that Haiti is um, in the um, conditions that it's in, one of the reasons that it's uh, that there's so much um, economic struggle is because Haiti was punished. Um, consistently for um, for actually uh, rebelling, um, revolting against enslavement successfully, and um, and so 
the um, the rest of the global community um, that was empowered would not work with Haiti and um, and um, and 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 was where where other countries um, and other communities are celebrated and supported in um, in their in their decision to be self determinant is pretty consistent with um, with communities that uh, where the majority of people are of African descent that that is um, particularly considered egregious and so the Haitian community was um, it, it consistently suffers as a result of that and. And it's amongst many communities that um, are used as um, political tools. And because it's a predominantly black community, um, it, that's the reason that um, Hillary Clinton um, was able to successfully uh, really go in and um, rape that country. And not only through the minimum wage, I mean, they use that money to secure um, and through eminent domain, um, secure the, um, the farmlands, that were there, they built all of those factories there. The people who were at first self-determined through their ability to farm were then forced to work in these factories at these um, at these really pennies um, on the dollar, pennies pennies an hour. Um, and they also, I don't know if you're aware that Hillary Clinton's um, brother um, has the a gold mine is in, in charge of a gold mine there. Um, the um, Clintons uh, also. Uh, uh, had all of the indigenous pigs in Haiti slaughtered so that the um, the pig farmers um, were um, out of business and they had to import the Clinton pigs to survive under the conditions of Haiti. And so now they're not able to um, farm their own pork as well. Um, you know, I mean, there's so much that the Clintons did. Um, and, 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 and it was and it's able to happen because um, of the because of racism. You know, the, the, this, this would not be permitted in a European country um, or in an, on an island that had predominantly European, um, you know, individuals, uh, people of European descent um, on it. But because it's a, a, predominant, it's a black country, um, any, you know, anything goes and there's, um, there's no advocacy. And so I was going to be a voice and, um, and advocate um, for the, But that's, you know, I mean, there's, there's Libya, you know, there's Rwanda. There's Honduras. I mean, you know, and, and where we put our fingers, you know, it's it, just like in the U.S., there's a, a, a massive connection also between the kind of um, militarized approach to um, dealing with black people here in the U.S. as there is to the imperialism that you find in, um, in, in on the continent and in the diaspora of Africa, as well as in other Sankis communities. Um, like in you know Latin American and South American communities, um, such as Honduras, um, Mexico, you know, and so um, yeah, they, they're, those those are communities that need to be advocated for here um, in our country by individuals. And I'm certainly not going to be the person who um, is going to be silent on those issues when I have an opportunity to represent them. Absolutely. You um you do mention um in in our, an article I read today you mentioned um, school to prison pipelines um and I've interviewed ninety candidates now from across the country every single candidate I ask what about for profit prisons what about school to prison pipelines you need to take a stance on that if that's on on your website get it up um so I totally understand and um. Can you touch on that? Can you explain why um, that's such a passion of yours? Well, I mean, everything, there's so many different ways that people are oppressed in this country. Um, and in general, the, uh, the forms of oppression are instituted through um, sun-kissed communities um, and predominantly um, black communities first. And, um, and so, you know, the, 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 there, there's not one specifically. I'm really passionate about liberation. I'm passionate about um, equity and justice, and that's just one of the myriad ways that um, that that we fail as a nation in um, in really having uh, a a community that is just for all the people. Um, and I think it's really important that you raise this about the candidates because. You know, I think that you would probably, I, I would think that you would become somewhat exceptional 
in and that you raise this issue at all because um, that's one of the things that I have found and I've been really um, unhappy about with most of the candidates um, out here and in this and in particular a lot of the uh, candidates that claim to be progressive um, and the activists and communities that claim to be progressive because these are things that um, are just not spoken about they're not um, they're not amongst the pet issues of the um, of the uh, the white left that is supposed to be in allegiance with um, with my community and other sun kissed communities and if you read the article that you're referencing um, is the article, We Have Nothing to Lose, right? That's, is that the article that you're talking mm -hmm. about? And the second part of it was, um, um, But Our Chains. And um, those articles are up on my website and up on Medium. And Progressive Army also just um, published those part. Well, published the first one and will be published in the second part. Um, and, and in that, I, I, I speak about this particular um, concern that I have. I've, I've come to be very disappointed you know, I've worked um, hard with people across the board. Um, I really, I really um, work hard to represent the ideals that I um, that I that I espouse, and I believe in equality. I believe in um, in the equality of humanity, um, and I, I fight, and I have been fighting from that belief. And there's so much that I was hearing from you know from people who are claiming that they have those same beliefs and claiming that they would um, that they have a revolutionary perspective around um, how we need to bring that to fruition, but then are not actually um, embodying that in their, um, in their activism and in their politics and in their um, policy demands. And, and it's quite disappointing when, you know, when my community has um, children being murdered, you know, I mean, Ayanna Stanley Jones um, had her, her blown, her brains blown out onto her grandmother's sofa while she was sleeping, you know, at seven years old. You know, that's what, that's the trauma that, that my community has to overcome. You know, we all watched the, um, so many of us, not everyone, but so many of us watched the traumatizing murder of Philando Castile, of Eric Garner, um, of Alton Sterling. Um, we learned about the murders of Sandra Bland, you know, that, I mean, Trayvon Martin, you know, I mean, Tamir Rice, I mean, it, and and we don't have um, we don't we, we we don't have the luxury of of focusing on um, issues that do, are not going to prevent murder from the state. You know, um, you know, let alone the reality of you know people being um, you know having the, the murderous police called for the most basic of incidents. You know that's um, beginning to be exposed more now. It's not a new thing at all. It's not a new thing, but it's being exposed now. We and 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 to have people not talking about these issues, or to have them talking about them privately at home, but they're running around and advocating for simply things like health. You know, healthcare for all, and then talking about something like healthcare for all without talking about what it means. If you're if you're looking at um, how that's going to roll out, depending on what community you come from. You know, I mean, uh, for instance, that $15 an hour, you know, mantra of the um, progressive community is, I mean, $15 an hour is, that would have been great when, you know, when, when you know, 10 or 10 years ago, maybe, you know, it's not sufficient now. And, um, you know, it, it, it will still ensure that people are barely surviving. And those are going to be the people who get those jobs. And nine times out of 10, they're not going to be as much out of my community. You know, the reality is that, you know, a black man with a with no record and has and, and, and with a college education has has a less chance, has less of a chance of securing employment than a white man with a record. So, um, you know, you can't just talk about fifteen dollars an hour as and, and as if that in and of itself is going to create some sort of equitous kind of environment and it's, it's not. And so um, I've been very disappointed with um, the progressive community um, that I, I fought hard with, I fought hard alongside with, and um, that um, then has turned us back on so many of the, the intricacies and the nuances of um, the issues that they do fight for and how they affect um, our communities and also the um, 
the actual issues that may not affect their community so much, but are really um, significant in our communities that they tend to be somewhat silent on. Absolutely. And I had those things written down as well, because it really struck me in that article, like, um, you know, these the 15 uh, fight for 15, it's a very blanket statement, but you're totally right that it doesn't address wage disparities uh, between, you know, and and also it doesn't address people who can't get jobs because, uh, you know, they're being discriminated against. Um, so those are really valid, important points that I think we all as progressives need to wake up and acknowledge those things. Um, LaShonda, I'm so glad you joined us. Um, LaShonda, who is amazing, said the lack of intersectionality on the left is my biggest pet peeve. Um, and she's totally right. And we talk about this all the time. Um, but, you know, and, and it's, you know, as a white person in the progressive movement, like I, it's, it's shameful. Like I totally acknowledge it's shameful. Um, we say that we're about unity. We say that we're about, um, you know, coming together and, and, but at the same time, I don't think we do nearly as good of a job as we should as, you know, considering other people and what they have to go through. That's so much harder than any of us ever have. Um, the the other thing that I wanted to address, too, is um, I'm sorry, I was distracted by the comments, um, you know you brought up some interesting points where even Medicare for all, um, you know, people, you know, it would be amazing because everyone could have access to health care and affordably so, but it doesn't um, address the people of color who are turned down for medications um, or uh, people are turned away because they're on Medicaid or people are turned away because they don't have insurance. Um, so do you want to kind of expand a little bit on that? Well, in addition to that, I mean, yeah, right now there are so many um, there are so many hospitals that um, are just there. There are more and more hospitals are um, refusing to accept Medicaid right now. Um, so, you know, that's one reality. But then even when a person gets into a hospital, how they're treated is very much impacted by who they are. I mean. You know, I have, I mean, nurses to me, I love nurses. Nurses are activists, in my opinion. I, I you know, I, I love nurses. I have a number of friends who are nurses. And um, and one of my friends was just telling me about how she was so upset because there was a young woman who came into the hospital and they would not give this young woman pain medicine. They wouldn't give her pain medicine and they just assumed, they, they believed very much that, she was just um, trying to get access to the drugs and they wanted to refuse her that access. And she was in great pain. She has sickle cell anemia. And so she was in great pain, but just looking at her, they made all of these assumptions about her. And that's not an unusual situation. Um, it's, um, it's, that's consistent. And also the, um, the assumption that, that black people, because black people are truly, truly are powerful, and strong that we don't experience pain, and um, and so between the the idea that we are drug addicts and the idea that we are super powerful people who don't experience pain, which is you know there's a lack of you know appropriate triage um, when it comes to um, handling people once they do get admitted, and so there's um, both of those realities that are just, you know, examples of um, what needs to also be a part of what's understood when you're talking about healthcare, because, you know, it's not going to be equally, that it's not going to be equally measured out um, to, to people from all these, from all of our communities. Absolutely. So let's take something like Medicare for all. Um, let's say there's a bill. I know Bernie came out with a bill, but there's some things that need to be reworked and more people need to vote on it. Um, but what would you like to happen with that bill? Would you like asterisks? Like what, what 
how could it be set up to um, be more sufficient, lack of a better term? Well, I think that the solution is not really about me, Yane, being an individual, um, you know, kind of thinking about this myself. I think that the solution is for someone like Bernie, if he wants to be introducing a bill, to be surrounding himself with individuals from the communities that deal with these issues and having those individuals who work in the healthcare community and who are a part of these oppressed communities being involved in the process of actually helping to, um, to figure out what needs to be in that bill. I don't work in the healthcare industry. I am, I don't work in that, I'm not a healthcare administrator. So I'm not the person who's gonna have that expertise. These, these are examples of issues, but there are more examples than what I would know of because I'm not in that industry. There are individuals who have that expertise and those people need to be sitting around the table. And the, this is a consistent thing that happens um, is that you have individuals who are not in the middle of a situation wanting to be the solutionaries and claim that they, they have all of the answers for that situation. It's like the, the, the new Poor People's Campaign being um, organized by wealthy people. I mean, maybe not wealthy in the 1% sense of the word, but certainly not poor. You know, why are the voices of the poor not at the forefront? Why are they not organizers of this? Is it there this assumption that because they're poor, they must not be able to organize? Because they're poor, they must not be intelligent? You know, I'm poor, you know, and, you know, in spite of the fact that I have, you know, a, a graduate degree, in spite of the fact that, you know, I, you know, have various skills and experiences, I still live in poverty. And so, um, you know, but my voice and my organizing is not at the forefront. And the individuals who thought of this, it really, to me, that what the onus was on them to say, here's an idea. Why don't we see if we, you know, why don't we connect with, you know, people from this community and see if we can use our resources and use our um, our access to um, to get behind them and um, and help them to um, to organize in the way that would work what they see fit and help them you know help empower their understanding of the solutions and, um, you know at this important anniversary you know maybe there are people who are already thinking about this but they don't have the platform that I have let's find those people and let's give them our platform um, that's not what's happening. Uh, these, too many people are coming trying to act like they have the answers. And to me, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of uncaring. And it's, and it's more about self-aggrandizement and less about the issue itself. Absolutely. I was so at I the think, people's campaign. Yeah, I, think Bernie, I think that Bernie's job would be to surround himself with people who are coming from um, from the communities that suffer the most. And, and that's one of, one, of, um, one of a few ways that I feel that he... Um, he fails because he, he he does not really do that except in a tokenistic way um, when he is um, kind of barring the credibility of people in order to kind of show um, his connection, but without actually doing the, the the deep digging work of you know really learning and growing um, and um, building out and 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 lifting the communities that um, that suffer the most. That's one of the things. That I feel like Bernie is really failing at, and um, and it's one of the one of the big disappointments that I have with um, with Bernie right now. When when you talk about the poor people, um, the poor people's campaign, I was at the one in D.C. and I I kind of got that feeling too that it was kind of. Um, it wasn't as organic as I would have liked it to be. Let's put it that way. Would, I know I'm going back about seven months, but did you feel that way about the uh, the women's march as well? Um, I felt like well, first of all, all of these marches and uh, all of these marches, I think um, they drive me crazy. Um, I, I, I really am very tired of them. Um, I feel like they are a um, co opting and appropriation of um, of really what is happens. In um, oppressed communities, you know, when when um, when when um, Mike Brown's murderer was um, was set 
was 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 let off. The community rose and um, and rose against that, right? And um, and it's called rioting, right? And and we speak very, you know, what we're doing is we're speaking to the the pain and coming together as a community. It's almost like a it's almost like a, a form of like a funeral and a uh, and a wake, but also it's a it's a, a war cry. Um, and 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 that's a very different energy than like raising hundreds of thousands of dollars from you know as as a non as nonprofit organizations organize creating a nonprofit or having a nonprofit raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and then getting people to fly across the country making money for the um, for the airline industries making money for the hotel industries making money for these wealthy um, these wealthy uh, restaurants um, and and then organizing these marches, permanent marches, and in, in collab collaboration and cooperation with the local police officers, and ignoring the local activist communities and the issues that the local activist communities are working on at the same time. It's um, it's really um, it's really insulting, and um, it's not effective. And what it's effective in, in doing is making people feel like they did something when they did nothing. There's there's no less hungry people. Um, my kids are still getting shot down in the street. They're still not getting the education that they deserve. They still have police in their education. I mean, there was a seven-year-old boy who was handcuffed waiting for it until his father came because he, his teacher felt that he was misbehaving in his classroom. You know, And he was probably behaving the way little um, white boys behave in their classrooms all the time and are just treated like they're just kids because that's what they are. But this little boy is handcuffed at seven years old because he's got police officers in, um, in his schools. And so, you know, none of these things were addressed, but a lot of people felt really good. They felt like now we've done something and they've done nothing. You know, nothing's changed. And a whole lot of money, I mean, with the money that was spent on these women's marches, I, I can't even imagine how many families could have been housed, how many families could have been fed. You know, it's it's actually um, completely, you know, and all these people, they're taking their selfies. It's like the same thing that was happening at Standing Rock. You know, people were at Standing Rock, you know, caping in for a weekend, you know, getting their pictures, you know, so that they could say that they had done it, but they weren't actually there fighting. You know, there were people who spent the entire, entire, entire time in the hotel, you know, and um, and, you know, offered no support. They didn't shovel any walks. They didn't cook any meals. They didn't wash any dishes, you know, but they get to say, oh, well, I was at Standing Rock and they can run around now yet saying Mini Wachoni and feeling, you know, like, you know, they are one with the indigenous and who's um, and, and, and they don't even know any of the names of any of the indigenous communities that they claim that they're one with. So yeah, it's, it's all of this is um, it's very frustrating. Um, and it gets me pretty, um, it, it's, it's creating a lot of impatience and, um, and not just with me, you know, I work with a lot of activists. Um, the majority of the activists that I work with are coming from sun kissed communities and, um, and a lot of those, there's a lot of frustration. Um, the, these white progressive spaces do not at all feel safe for, um, for people who are not white and who are activating and who are talking about the issues and concerns of our communities. And, um, and so, yeah, um, I don't feel good about the Women's March. I didn't feel good about the Climate March. I don't feel good about, um, you know, the any of these any of these marches um and i don't think that there's real dialogue that's being had about these issues even the gun control issue you know i don't think that there's real dialogue that's being had about that it's a big deal to decide to um take guns away from oppressed communities that are the first ones that are targeted by militarized police you know i'm not for the removal of any kind of guns that police have I don't want people from my community having to address uh, militarized police with handguns if they decide that they're going to come aggressively in our community. So, you know, I, I don't agree with that idea. I do think that there's issues and that those issues need to be addressed. I think that children certainly should be feeling safe at school and shouldn't have to be worried that they're going to 
um, you know, end up being shot by, you know, shot by their one of their peers or their classmates. Certainly that's an issue. Um, but um, but I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe without um, and the idea of really um, working for liberation um, and thinking that um, we're going to have like a whole citizens community without guns and we've got police with tanks. Yeah, absolutely. I, as, as far as the marches go, I think one 